talk about today is the fact that no matter what's happening in your life, you can be a part of changing somebody else's story. And it's easy when life gets difficult, it's easy to get your eyes on yourself, to not think about others. When things are difficult or you're going through a trial or going through a struggle, tr struggle or a struggle, if you're going through a struggle, that sounds like something from a cartoon, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, but anyway, but if you're going through this trial. So, so here's the thing. So last night we had five people stand up uh, uh, to let us know that they've become part of Surfside. And we've got nine folks. And these two people are going to be really mad at me because they're very shy. But I'm going to make them stand up and we're going to pray for them. Uh, but I'm going to read all the names that are here for today. Uh, and I don't know if they're all in this service, but I, uh, Deborah Burdick, I didn't see you this in this. Oh, oh yeah, Debbie, I should know you. Come on up here. Chris Hyatt, are you in this service? And then uh, Steve and Patty, Steve McCrory and Patty Moeller. And you guys, I know, they're the ones who are going to be mad at me for bringing them up. And we're, come on up. We're going to pray real quick. And while they're coming up, here's what I want you to know. One of our guys who works with the military is in Afghanistan today, which is actually tonight there. And he's watching online. So would you thank him for watching? And we're glad. And let me pray for you guys. And then... All right, would you guys join me as we pray for these new folks? Father, thank you that you continue to grow our church. You continue to bring people, um, Lord, that we can be an encouragement to them and they to us. Lord, we pray that we would be a place that continues to bring people home to you and encourages them in their faith and their walk with you. Lord, thank you for these folks. I pray you'd bless them with your spirit and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you guys for coming. All right, we're glad to have you. Steve and Patty were already, I call them our snowmen. They actually did the snow, and they're going to be doing the snow for our, uh, we already put them to work. They're going to be doing the snow for the uh, winter fest coming up. And if you don't know what our snow is, it's basically soap, but that's all good. So today we're going to talk about peace with God, and I'm going to give you a very simple three points, and it goes like this, how to walk in peace. So here's my question for you if you've been a Christian for a long time. Are you enjoying the peace that God's given you? Do you enjoy the peace? Do you, do you recognize it or have you gotten a hold of it? See, because here's, here's what I believe. Now, this is an A&W. If you're going to drink root beer, how many of you like root beer? How many don't like root beer? How many are indifferent to root beer? How many don't know that I'm talking about root beer? Okay, so... So one thing about root beer, if you shake a root beer up and let the cap off, you've just ruined the root beer. Like a, a soda will survive a little bit, but if you shake a root beer up, it's just dead. I mean, that's just, it's done. You're done with root beer. Now you just have a sweet flavored drink that's just disgusting to be real honest. So anyway, so, so here's the thing I know about the Christian life for so many people is for many people, because they don't recognize that God has given them his grace, because they don't recognize his righteousness in them, which is we're going to talk about all these things today, is they feel like they're under pressure all the time. They think that their life is about performing for God. And so they just more and more pressure. And every time they come to church, they feel like they've got one more thing on their checklist. You know, the pastor is going to get up this morning. He's going to give you three more things to do. Well, you got 50, 52 sermons you know, and so if you come every week, right? So, so then you got a hundred and whatever. I can't do math that quick. One hundred fifty-six. Did I do the math right? Uh, uh, things to do by the end of the year, and and so you know, it's like, well, I can't, I haven't even done the first one, and so we start feeling this pressure, and we shake up the can, and then every once in a while we say we got to let off steam, and then the other thing that happens is because we live our lives that way, our kids grow up in this environment, and they think that God is about. I'm going to get you. And, and the pressure's on all the time, and they, and they feel guilt. And instead of walking in freedom and walking in peace with God, they walk in shame and condemnation. And then we wonder why they don't want to be a part of church, why they don't want anything to do with God. Because the only thing they knew about them was something you told them, or, or maybe, you know, you, you, you threatened them, you know, God's going to get you, or whatever, you know. And, and if we're not careful, that pressure is always on. And so today, as we look at Romans chapter 5, I want to give you some really good news, and that's this. God absolutely loves you. He loved you before you gave your life to him. 
And if you're a Christian, the good news is once you're his child, he still loves you. And, and so, okay, years ago, and I, I think I threw the trophy away. I know. Because it didn't mean much to me. Years ago, I got to play in a golf tournament with some other pastors. And uh, it was actually paid for. Um, there was a group in Orlando that used to pay for it every year. So I got to go to play at these awesome golf courses, which if you don't know anything about golf, let me tell you a couple things. If you've never played, number one, it's a horribly frustrating, evil game, um, which I enjoy. I don't get to play much, but, but I enjoy golf. But um, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm like a 110 on a good day golfer, which is like really bad. Like if you're a golfer, like Tiger Woods, like 40, uh, uh, well, maybe 50, but, um, but uh, 64. Something like that. Anyway, so, you know, these guys are really good, and, and I'm, you know, 110, and I'm picking up. So it's not even really 110, okay? I mean, I'm going snowman is all I'm putting down on that one. I'm not going beyond the snowman. If you don't know what that is, that's an eight is a snowman. Anyway, so, um, but I also play Grace Golf. But we got to play, and I'd never played before. We got to play best ball. And they divided the teams based on what you wrote down as your score. And, of course, I'm honest so they had it, us divided into teams of four people. And they gave you a decent golfer, a good golfer. They gave you then the two people in the middle and then me. So, so this is how bad it was. The first time I got up to hit the ball, uh, when I hit the ball, everybody on my team openly groaned. That's how bad it was. Because it went into the, it went about 80 yards, which is awful, by the way. Um, uh, I sometimes can hit 200 and something, which is like awesome, and I'm like proud of myself. But a lot of times that 200 is towards somebody else and not towards where it's supposed to be going. But anyway, so I shanked it into the woods. Everybody groans. But we had a pastor on our team who used to be a pro golfer. And that guy got up. Let me tell you something. When I hit the ball, it sounds nothing like when this guy hit the ball. When this guy hit the ball, you had a hard time seeing the ball leave because it left in such a hurry. It was afraid of him. And it went all the way to where the little pin was that you have to hit it. You know, the, the cup that you have to hit it into. It takes me a long time to get there. And here, let me tell you something about best ball. So I hit it into the woods. We drove over in the cart to the woods. I went searching in the woods. I found my ball. I pick it up. And then we get to drive all the way to where that guy hit the ball. And I get to put my ball right next to him. And then I go, boop. And he's like, that's a two. I'm like, I got a two. He's like, you do get a two. Why? Because we're playing best ball. Why? Because it doesn't matter what I do. I'm dependent on that guy. And his score is now my score. It was awesome. I got a trophy. I got a, we beat all the other pastors. I got a trophy. Now, they only had to take two hits from me. Two hits. So, of course, this guy hit it a foot from the cup. And I'm like, there's one. I hit it right in. I was like, it was like Price is Right. Right? And so, so I was all excited. I got, I got a trophy. It's a little, I, I threw it away. Sorry. I just can't keep everything, you know. It's one of those things. But here's what's awesome. When you give your life to Christ, you inherit his righteousness. You get his score. You, you get to participate with him. You get his justification, his righteousness. And today when we look in Romans chapter 5, one of the things we're going to look at is, is this idea. Paul talks about the law and how we're justified. And Paul, when talking to the Romans, knew he was talking to people who understood Legal matters. The, the Romans had laws for hundreds of years. Let me give you a few terms that came from Rome. I told you every week I was going to give you a little bit from Rome, but Rome had a constitution. Here's a few words that you probably heard before that we got from the Romans. Checks and balances. Sounds familiar? Some of you haven't checked your checkbook, but that's different. All right. Separation of powers. Vetoes. Filibusters. Quorum requirements. Term limits. I want to say that one again. Term limits. I'll never forget the guy in Brevard County who said, I believe in term limits until it was time for him to run again. Then he didn't believe in them anymore. Oh, you said his name out loud. You're not allowed to do that. All right. <laughs> Impeachments, which sounds like a canned food, doesn't it? Anyway, impeachments, powers of the purse, regularly scheduled elections, even this, the idea of block voting and electoral college came from the Roman 
constitution. So they understood these terms. And so Paul is talking to them and he says to them very early on in this passage, hey, listen. In chapter 1 through 4, I talked about how you would never measure up. If you were a Jew, you'd never be able to keep all the law. If you were a Gentile, you couldn't even keep the law of your heart. And so what do we do about that? And he starts with the word therefore. And if you had an English teacher, your English teacher said, when you hear therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for, right? And so he talks about all this. So today we're going to talk about how you can be filled with God's love in the hardest times. You can know he loves you in the good times, and you can recognize that you've been made right with God. So here's number one. Allow his spirit to fill you with his love, and I would have liked to put in the hard times, but that made the point way too long, and it would have taken up three lines, and it would have messed up our font. But that's what this is talking about. Allow his spirit to fill you with his love in the hardest times in life. Listen to what Paul says in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, remember, what's it there for? Since we have been justified through faith. So that word justified, remember, justified means just as if I've never sinned. You get to play best ball. You, you, you get to do a horrible shank, hit it into the woods, and God goes, come on. What, what do you mean, come on? Yeah. You, you mean I don't have to hit it from here? Nope. Justified through faith. We have peace. By the way, this word we have here literally means that we enjoy. It's the idea of let's enjoy peace or we need to get a hold of peace. When's the last time you enjoyed the peace God's given you? Too, too often we're worried about the next thing or the next speed bump in life or the next difficulty or the next challenge instead of recognizing that even in the middle of the hardest day, we have his peace. And then it continues, peace with God through our Lord Jesus, whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in that same word. That's the word boast also. But we also glory in our sufferings. By the way, it doesn't say that we glory about our sufferings. So nobody's like, oh, I'm so glad I got sick. It was just awesome. Oh, I'm so glad. Man, that was awesome. When that attorney called me, I was excited. I was, when they said lawsuit, I was like, oh, joy, right? No, no. But even in that, you say, God, you got this. And then it continues. And we boast in our hope, the glory of God. Not only so, we glory in our sufferings because, why? Suffering produces perseverance. By the way, nobody likes that. But you know what that means right there? That's no pain, no Right, we all know that. See, you said it. You didn't mean it because you sounded terrible. It sounded like a cult in here. I said, no pain. You went, gain. It was really, that was really bad. It was like sheep. It really did sound it sounded closest, closest to sheep I've ever heard you sound. That was really bad. So let's try that again. No pain, no? Gain. Very much better. You worried me. You went, but gain. Okay. <laughs> you guys, next time somebody says that, you just need to say it the way you said it first time to them. And they'll be like, what? What's wrong with you? And you're like, it's a church thing. The greater good. All right. That's from a movie, and I just randomly do movie quotes, and when Michelle's here, she's like, I know that movie, and I'm like, you shouldn't know that movie. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Don't you love that when your dad would say something like, we're going to give you a little character development today. With us, that meant you're digging a ditch, usually. That's what my dad meant. I'm like, Dad, you can hire a truck to uh, do that ditch in about five minutes. He's like, yeah, but i got to teach you boys how to do hard work. I'm like, yeah. Thanks a lot. We'll never do that again. Uh, character, that's why my brother and I are both pastors, because he just put us in a ditch until we got tired of doing construction. <laughs> character, hope. And then it says this. Hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because, listen, listen. Why does, it, why does all this work out? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, when trials come, our first response is to say, why is this happening to me? Or if it's for somebody we love, why is this happening to them? We, we tend to, that's our first response. But Paul says, when you really have God's love poured into your heart and you really understand this peace that you have with God, what's going to happen? You're going to say, God, I know that you can even use this. God, I know you can use this situation where this happened. God, I know this person in my life who did this terrible thing. It, it, listen, it's not, it never says in the Bible, God's so glad that person did a terrible thing to you. 
But it says he can even use that thing for his good. Now, I will tell you this. You have to forgive them. You have to forgive that person that did that horrible thing to you. Because if you don't, you can't walk in love if you don't first walk in forgiveness. You, you can't walk in love unless you can let it go. Let it go. In Hebrews 10.34, Paul's talking to the early church and he basically says, You joyfully accepted them confiscating your property. I'm like, I don't know if I would joyfully accept that. Why? Because they knew there was something greater going on. And when you understand that God is doing something greater, then you can walk in the difficulty. That doesn't mean you walk in the difficulty going, this is great. I just love it. I hope I'm in the hospital again. That was fun. Let's do that again. Especially the bills. That's the best part, right? They send you bill after bill. I had a hospital visit a few months ago. I just had a bill come in. I'm like, where did this one come from? It has somebody's name. And my wife says, is that somebody who helped you? I went, I don't know. I said, that there were people coming in and out of the room. I think somebody walked in and said, Bill, and walked out. <laughs> right? No idea. So do, do you joy in that bill? No. But you say, you know what, God? You can use all these things for the good. So I'm going to allow you to use it. I'm going to know that you're going to do that. How can I do that? God, would you pour your love into my heart? So that even when I'm going through a big difficulty, I can say, God, you can use me even now. God can use you when you're in the hospital. Do you know that? I've seen God use people. I've seen my mom pray for people while my mom's the one in the hospital bed. God can use you when you're going through a trial. Hey, he may bring people into your life that you can influence through a trial or a difficulty that you would never be able to influence. There may even be something that you went through years ago that now somebody else is going through. And guess what? That love is poured into your heart and you can go to them and say, you know what? I went through the very same thing. I went through the same difficulty, the same challenge. Let me tell you how God helped me to walk through that. So here's the question, though. Do I listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit? And what does that mean? You know, I, I tell people all the time, they're like, well, what does God sound like? I make it very easy for you. Most of the time, if you're trying to listen to God and you hear something that's unselfish, it's probably not you. Because typically, you know what we think about? Us, ourselves. By the way, do you know why we do announcements at the beginning of church? I've never told people this. I'm going to tell you. It's a big secret now. Do you know why we do them? Because we don't have to do them. We could just put them on the screen. And people listen and there's auditory people. You know why we do them? Because they said that when people first enter a building, they're very uncomfortable. And they're concerned about the people around them. But once they talk to the people around them, and once they hear what's going on, it helps them to relax. And then they can listen. Before that, they can't listen. So it's one of the reasons we do all the things we kind of do at the beginning to help people to adjust who haven't been to church in years. I've had people come and say, if I come to church, the building's going to fall down. And I always tell them, listen, if Paul Chineris can go here to church and the building hasn't fallen down, it will be fine. <laughs> He's not even in this service and I'm making fun of him. All right. So allow his spirit to feel you. Number two, receive God's love as his child. This is one of the things the enemy will do to you all the time. Does God really love you? Oh, you've messed up too bad now. L let me tell you how the enemy works. You know, the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's what he does. He comes to you and goes, hey, you commit that sin, it's not a big deal. You can commit that sin, it's not a big deal. Oh, give in to that. Everybody gives in to that. It's not a big deal. And as soon as you mess up, then the enemy comes back and goes, boy, I can't believe you did that. What an idiot you are. God doesn't love you anymore. God doesn't care about you anymore. And if you're not careful, you'll go through life thinking you've got to earn all the time God's love. Listen to what Paul says here. You see at just the right time. By the way, this passage, this part of the passage changed a guy named Martin Luther's life. Because he hated God even though he was a, was a uh, monk. Because he couldn't do everything that God wanted him to do. He, he knew that God was always mad at him until he got a hold of this passage and it changed his life. Listen to what he says. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the churchgoers. <laughs> I like how you corrected me. That was good. He died for the ungodly. People running from him. And then it continues, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But... God, 
demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can't do enough. You can't perform enough. It's best ball. You, didn't, you, you can't earn your way to God, so he came to you and said, come on. I've already hit, drop. Since we have now been justified, that word justified means just as if you've never sinned. It's a term like in court where they say you are no longer guilty. You ever been pulled over and they didn't give you a ticket? You didn't run after that policeman going, well, listen, I deserve a ticket. Could you please give me one? Nobody does that. If you do, you're crazy. Why? You're just grateful and thankful. Oh, I didn't get a ticket. Boy, I deserved one, but I didn't get one this time. What is that? You were justified. You don't chase the ticket. Some of us are justified by faith, and yet we think, oh, but God, you should, you really should charge me with that crime. And then it continues. For if we, oh, excuse me, since we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we boast, and that's that word for rejoice, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. We've been reconciled. You're now part of the fam- family, if you're Italian. Family. You've been reconciled, brought back together. So here's the question. Have I become a child of God through Christ. If you're his child, listen, he loved you before you were his child. So now that you're his child, guess what? Don't keep trying to earn it. Surrender. The Christian life is all about surrender. Becoming a Christian is about surrender. God, I surrender to you. And what happens is if you've been a Christian for a while, that guilt and shame, those old habits come back. The old way of thinking comes back. And so you have to surrender that again. Number three, recognize your righteousness in Christ. Now, we live in Florida, so I think this is going to be a pretty good showing of hands. How many of you have ever been motion sick on a boat? How many of you have never been motion sick? We're going to take you guys out to Tampa. We're going to put you on all those roller coasters out there. I think we can do it. I think we can make it happen. So I just got my eyes worked on. I got my other eye fixed this week, and I'm having a little bit of vertigo, which is fun. I think what it is, my brain's like, why can you see with both eyes? We don't like this. We're going to make the world spin just a little. So while I'm standing here, the world just kind of does this all the time. So it's a lot of fun. It's very exciting, good for your stomach. But I don't know if you've ever been on a boat and got off a boat and then closed your eyes, and you still felt the boat. Here's the deal. When you, did somebody just yawn so loud that it made me feel bad? All right. So is it that bad of a sermon? No. Really? Okay. All right. So, so here's the thing. When you feel like you're still in the boat, are you still on the boat? No. If you say to somebody, I'm still on the boat, they're looking at you and they realize that you're giving them an analogy or you're psychotic. One of the two things just happened, right? And so you're not on the boat anymore. Here's the thing. Because before we had a relationship with Christ, the enemy always fed us guilt and shame. Some people become Christians and they have that old habit of guilt and shame. And so they walk in guilt, they walk in shame. I'm going to talk about what this looks like in just a second, but let me read this first. Just as sin entered the world through one man, okay, so Adam. So if you haven't gotten mad at Adam lately, there you go. Just as sin entered the world through, through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all sin. So this is where we get this idea of original sin. This is where we get the idea of the uh, Adam life is what they call it, or original sin. It's the reason why when you have a child and they're two years old and they're such an angel, such an angel, and then they look at you and they go, no. And the mom looks at the dad and goes, you taught him that. And you're like, no, I didn't teach him. They just Why? Because you don't have to teach a kid to do that. There's, there's rebellion in us. We're born with it. We have a default. It's, it's DOS 1.0, right? Adam 1.0. We're, we're, we, we have this desire to sin. We pursue the wrong things. And so, but then it continues. We're not left there. And then it continues. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, there's that making right with God, 
reign, listen to this, reign in life. Are you reigning in life or just enduring life? Because if we're in Christ, we should be enjoying that peace. We should be reigning in life. Now, reigning in life doesn't mean that you're rich. Whatever the TV preachers say, success, spiritual success is not about the amount of money in your bank account. That's what the Pharisees thought. They were wrong. Okay? That's not what success is. Reigning in life has to do with your spirit, has to do with your heart, has to do with how you walk through life, has nothing to do with how much you have. That's Americanism, not Christianity. All right? So then continue. Provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass, that Adam, resulted in condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous through Christ. He hit the ball a lot better. Aren't you glad he went before you? The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Now that is a big deal. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me ask you this. Do I live in condemnation or life? Now I'm going to explain this again. You're going to hear this every week. Jesus, when we give him our life, we get his righteousness. That's our position. You are justified. You have been made righteous. You are no longer under condemnation. You receive his God sees you as holy. And then you say to me, but Eric, nay, nay, just this morning, I yelled at my spouse. Practically, we don't always live in that holiness. But let me tell you what it looks like. When you're really a Christian, when you've really given your life to Christ, there's this pull to go back to his righteousness. And 1 John kind of addresses this a little bit when it says if you walk in darkness, you're not in the truth. What that means is if you continue to pursue unrighteousness, boy, you just love being over here and doing whatever you want to do, then maybe, just maybe, you've never received his righteousness. But if even when you mess up and you blow it, there's a pull towards being right with God, that holy pull towards him, God, forgive me for that. Help me make things right. Help me to live the life that you gave me positionally. And when you blow it and you're over here, you don't have to say, I got to earn my way back to God. You know what God says? Hey, I already hit the ball. Just pick up and come back. Make things right. That's why it says in scripture, if you confess your sin, he is faithful. By the way, you'll notice it doesn't say you're faithful. It says he's faithful and he's just and he'll forgive us all sins. So when you end up over here practically and you blow it and you drive on I-4, or you drive through the city of Titusville now? I don't know what is wrong with the people in Titusville now, but they have all gone crazy now. I'm not sure. It's like somebody, somebody put Miami driving up there suddenly. I don't know what happened. Last time I drove through Titusville, I'm like, these people are as crazy as I-4 now. And so when you say something or you think something or you look at something and you go over here in the unrighteousness, you confess it and you say, God, forgive me. Thank you that you've given me your righteousness. You don't have to wallow in it. You don't have to stay over there because he's already gone and saying, come on, I already hit the ball. Get back in the game. So no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what difficulty you're going through, live over here. Understand that he's given you his holiness and his righteousness and his peace. You can enjoy peace with God regardless of what's happening around you. Regardless of what's happening in you. Someday your body will fail and you can still have peace. Someday your eyes will quit working. That's already happened to me once. And someday they'll quit again and I can have peace. Someday when life is tough, you can still have peace. You can walk with him. You can be filled with his love in the hard times. Know that he loves you in the good times and recognize you've been made right with God. So here's how to walk in peace each day. Number one, be filled with his spirit. God, would you fill me with your spirit each day? Lord, when something bad happens, would you show me what I'm supposed to do? And the Lord will give you promptings. The Holy Spirit will give you that unselfish prompting. Hey, pray for so-and-so. Go out of your way to bless so-and-so. Go out of your way to, to, to look out for somebody else. Use this experience to help somebody on your journey. Receive his love. 
God, I want to receive your love today. I want to walk in it. You can't enjoy God's love unless you consciously say, God, I want to enjoy your love. God, thanks for what you've done for me. You know why we sing songs of praise? Because oftentimes when you're singing them, you all of a sudden go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I'm singing one of these songs. I'm like, oh, yeah. God does love me. He cares about me. Look what he did for me. And then finally, recognize your righteousness. Not because of what you've done, but because he's so good. You don't deserve the trophy. When we get to heaven, he's going to give us a crown of righteousness, the Bible says. You know how much you deserve that? Just as much as I deserve that trophy that I, I got a trophy. And when we get to heaven, we're going to get a trophy. And we're going to lay it at his feet because we're going to recognize, God, I don't deserve this trophy. And that's how good God is. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Listen, he loves you already. And when you surrender your life to him, he gives you everything that's his. You get to drop your ball right where he is in righteousness, in love, in peace. So if you've never done that, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. We don't do a formal invitation where people come down, but I'll be here after the service. You can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here and the truth is you're not enjoying the peace of God. You're, you're walking in instability and frustration. You're worried about everything. Hey, surrender. It's all about surrender. God, I want to surrender to your righteousness. I know you love me. So just do that today. Let's go to Lord in prayer to close today. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you so much that you love us. Father, it's so easy to walk back into that condemnation that we grew up with. So easy to walk back with feeling that we're never good enough because we're used to feeling that way. Lord, I pray instead that we would receive your righteousness knowing that you have given us a gift that we could never earn. Lord, help us to enjoy that gift of peace with you. Lord, I pray for that one today who's struggling. They're struggling with a lack of peace. They're struggling with anxiety. They're struggling with guilt and shame. That, Father, I pray if they're not a believer, that today they would surrender to you. But, Lord, if they're a believer, that right now they would recognize who they've been made. That they don't have to earn their way to you. But, Father, they just have to follow you. So help us to follow you each day. In Jesus' name, amen.